Allison. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming tonight um, for our presentation on the truth about vaccines. My name is Amanda Glasser, and I am a health educator for the Chelmsford Board of Health, along with Chelmsford Public Schools. Throughout the year, we collaborate with local partners to provide residents of the greater Chelmsford area with the presentations on a variety of different subjects here at the library. Tonight, we have Dr. Eric Meekle joining us. Dr. Meekle is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics and practices here at Chelmsford Pediatrics. Dr. Meekle earned his doctorate of medicine from Cornell University and did his res I'm sorry, residency at the Floating Hospital for Children in, at New England Medical Center. Dr. Meekle has an extensive professional background in education and also has many publications. He is a chief of pediatrics at Lowell General and has served as a member on the Chelmsford Board of Health for two years now. Before you begin, I would like to ask that everyone please silences their cell phones and makes note of the exit in case of an emergency, which is the back and back to the left. In addition, restrooms are located um, to the right outside of the door. Also, if you could please um, sign in and complete an evaluation, I will collect it at the end. And if we don't have any other questions or concerns, please welcome Dr. Meekle. Thank you. Howdy. So hi, uh, welcome. My name is Eric Meekle. Um, in terms of naming this, that I could have gotten a little fanciful and I was thinking about like including things about witches and pirates and why Canada is not part of the United States, which you'll find out in a moment. Um, but I guess the truth of vaccines is probably as good as uh, almost anything else or alternatively might have been uh, a victim of their own success. Uh, one thing about vaccines is that we're talking about diseases that even in the 20th century when we made smallpox extinct, about a half a billion people died of smallpox in the 20th century. And even in 2000, if we talk about living viruses like measles, while in 2000 in the United States we had zero cases of measles, that year alone about 550,000 children died worldwide of the measles. So these are things that in my career, which so far has spanned about 25 years, I've actually never seen either of those diseases. However, they are out there. And if our population becomes susceptible again, they could do some real damage very quickly, things that we haven't seen in 100 years. Um, but that said, uh, I was going to introduce myself at some point. I'm Eric Meekle, uh, and I guess, like as uh, Amanda said, I went to Cornell University, um, chief of pediatrics over at Lowell General Hospital. I've been a pediatrician in Chelmsford for about 21 years now, and I've been on the board of health in Chelmsford for about uh, two years now. One thing, why introductions, why whenever you have any piece of information that you want to understand where that information is coming from, and also make sure you know who's paying for it, is to kind of know what biases might be coming into the information that you are getting. From my perspective, I really, by being here and such, I'm more, I'm more interested in having a community that is protected and safe. Uh, I am paid for what I do in my office. Uh, ironically, this is Massachusetts, so pretty much all of the vaccinations that are recommended for children are paid for by the state until they're at least 19 years old, and certain ones are paid for beyond that. So I'm not paid to give vaccinations in my office. Um, I am paid to be the chief of pediatrics over at Lowell General, it's a stipend. And I give about half of that back to the nursing staff because they're the ones doing the real work over there. I am not paid to be on the board of health in Chelmsford, and I am not paid to be here talking tonight, at least that I know of. So she's saying no. So myself, uh, I tend to be a bit of a skeptic, and there's times I'm a bit of a mutt in terms of where people have come from, but I don't know if it's because of the quarter of the family that lived on the Scottish borders and kept getting hit by one side or the other as they were overrun. I don't know if it comes from being raised in Florida. I went to high school in a town where people were very sweet to you, but they still required African Americans to live in a certain quarter 20 years after desegregation supposedly happened. So that I tend to be skeptic when I get new information and try to understand where it comes from. 
uh, in terms of biases and what I was raised with, these are my grandmother's grandmother's parents, uh, actually in their 60s. And they look like sad people. They are always described in family stories as sad people. And the reason I put up is because it's that sadness. There was really three reasons that they were. The first was that they were what was called Freidenkers, which at the time meant that they believed in reason, they did, did, believed in democratic government, they did not believe that uh, a king or monarch should rule, they believe, did not believe that the church should, ne should necessarily rule. And after the 1848 failed German unification uh, in Frankfurt, they got a little letter that said, please come down to town hall and have your heads removed on Monday. And so Christian sent his wife, Frederica, and their surviving children on the next boat to the United States. He sold, they had a small factory and a house, he sold those at a loss and then he caught the next boat. So they failed in their aspirations for government. They lost their livelihood. But the main reason they were, sa they were sad is because they actually had 16 children of which 13 died. And for Germany in the 19th century, one thing we tend to forget is that the survival rate for children at that time was about 50%. So that families were large, be but because they were trying to make sure that somebody might survive. Um, other than that, that's over in Europe. On this side, my mom's Yankee side, uh, my great-great-grandfather Ben was one of four kids. And in the course of two weeks, uh, we had the papers at home. One week his brother died, and the next week his brother and sister died of diphtheria. Uh, diphtheria, it gets your throat, it swells up, and it's, it strangles you. And he had to watch this, and that started three generations of only children on that side of the family. Um, and for better or for worse, uh, not involved in the action, but uh, for those who have heard about the actions at Pittsburgh, at Fort Pitt, uh, where the British Army gave smallpox-laden blankets to Native Americans. Uh, my forefather, John MacDonald, he was an ensign in the 77th Highlanders. He wasn't involved in that action, but he was technically there when it happened. Uh, there's a legacy that people forget about their own personal, their own family's traumas, their own involvement with these over the years. So the next slide is Boston. This was a map that was actually done in 1722. And the important thing I wanted to talk about was 1721. Because in April, well, for Boston, it was a time when the theocracy, the fact that the Puritan church used to run the colony, after the 1660s when they had done away, let's say they had hung a few uh, Quakers after the 1790s when they had the Salem witch trials, the power of the church was waning. It was becoming a more secular government. That government had the power of the purse after 1791, uh, 1691 and they were increasingly at odds with uh, the government. And so it had definitely become factionalized uh, between the different groups. Um, and in that, there was a warship called the HMS Seahorse. In April 1721, it was escorting convoys back and forth to the Caribbean uh, to protect them from pirates. And when it came back from Barbados, the captain, Thomas Durrell, was a little bit secretive of about an issue he had. He had several deaths, which he did not record the reason for on the way back to Boston. And even when he got into Boston and he heard that they were going to inspect his ship, because at the time, if you had a possible infection, you were supposed to go to quarantine out on Spectacle Island and until the disease passed. He didn't want to do that, and so he avoided it by going over to Castle Island first and while there, a, there was a 15-year-old cabin boy who had asked for permission to stay in Boston as long as he went back to the ship as soon as it came back to port. 
he was rowed out by one of his slaves, and that boy's name was Charles Paxton, and while there, they actually, the slave and another crew member went back into Boston, and about a week later were found to actually have smallpox. And the government, there were various factions in this group. The government did not want to de declare a um, outbreak because that meant that the port would be closed and this was the third largest port in the British Empire at the time. Uh, it would destroy their economy. So they were trying to hush up anything that happened. There were two newspapers in town who at different times had had the postmaster and so they both were declared themselves to be official no newspapers and they would only print what the government wanted so they wouldn't report these things. Uh, Captain Durrell eventually moved the ship over to Long Wharf so he could unload and when he found he was going to be inspected again he went over to Bird Island to avoid an inspection and actually discharged three members, three crew members who were believed to have uh, smallpox. So at this point, there was increasing number of small, n people infected with smallpox in Boston. The government was trying to suppress it. And one of the odd things is that there were actually two people in Boston who had been waiting for this moment. Boston tended to have a smallpox outbreak about once every 12 years. This was the sixth outbreak. And that this last one had been 19 years after the, uh, after the last, so about half the population was young enough that they had not been exposed to smallpox before, uh, that they were susceptible if, if, if they were exposed. The two people who were waiting, one, uh, and I'm going to show you what smallpox looks like for a moment. This is Bangladesh, 1973. It's one of the last cases. Uh, in the 1970s, the last wild cases of smallpox, uh, once they resolved, the, they declared that smallpox was extinct. Uh, currently, there are two vials known to exist. One is at the CDC headquarters in Atlantic, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia and the other is at the Russian equivalent over in uh, the Russia. This particular case is actually a favorable case. The term variola, which is the scientific name for smallpox, is because it had a varied presentation the way that the pox actually looked. And in this case, the fact that each of these are distinct lesions, they don't flow all into one, meant that this person was going to be very sick. They might end up being blind as a result of this. They would definitely have some pox when it was, had resolved, but they were most likely going to s survive. Smallpox actually kills a third of all people who catch it. So the, this, this child did well, but 30% would die. Um, so of the people who were waiting for it, this is one. This is Cotton Mather. He's third generation, one of the senior ministers in the Puritan church in Boston. And he, when he was a teenager, he graduated Harvard at about 15 or 16 years old. And soon after that, he wrote a paper where he had interviewed a child and determined that there were witches, that witches could be determined by stigmata, and saying that, uh, oh dear, everything's okay, gonna be okay. <laughs> so, didn't mean to make somebody cry. But he said that spectral evidence was real. He did not want it to be used in courts, but he said that there would be, that a witch could project her body uh, elsewhere and that that was the actual basis for the evidence in the Salem witch trials. So he wanted to be a man of learning and this marred his reputation and he had spent the next 30 years looking for a chance to redeem himself, did some work on grafting and such with uh, American plants, was actually admitted to the fellow of the, the, the Royal Society uh, over in London. But with regard to why he was waiting for smallpox, in 1706, 15 years before this, he had been given a slave uh, by his congregation by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus came from West Africa, they're not sure where, and when he 
had lost a few of his children to smallpox in an earlier epidemic, he asked Onesimus, have you had smallpox? In part, the original question was because if he had smallpox, he'd be immune and safe, and he ha if he hadn't, he needed to be protected. And what Onesimus said was yes and no, that he had been exposed to and was immune to it, but he hadn't had the real disease. And when Cotton Mather asked him what happened, he described what is termed inoculation, that you cut the skin below the level of the epidermis down into the dermis, and you would take a bit of the pus from a lesion from somebody who had smallpox, you put it in a little container, hold it up close to your body to keep it warm, and then you would put the pus from this other, from the infected person into the healthy person, and the healthy person would then develop smallpox, but it would be an easier course that they would normally survive. This practice, it it's, wasn't written so much so that there are times that articles that of back then would say that this was, had been done from time immemorial in places like India and Western Africa and Turkey and others that showed that it had actually like recently entered into places like Constantinople. Constantinople, the, uh, they would do this procedure. Sometimes it would be based on a piece of thread that had the pus on it and it would be allowed to dry. Sometimes they would take scabs, let them dry, crush them, and blow it up the nostrils. Uh, they used one side for females, one side for males. And in Constantinople, there was a woman by the name of Lady Montague whose husband was the British uh, ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. And she had witnessed this. She had actually had one of her, her children inoculated in uh, 1714. And she wrote back home about it to the Princess of Wales. But before she did that, there were actually two physicians, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Timonius and Dr. Jacobus uh, Pilari Pilarinus, who in 1716 wrote back to the Royal Society and those papers were published by the Royal Society and had been read by Cotton Mather. So he thought he was going to redeem his name with regard to the witch trials by starting these inoculation and saving the population from an outbreak. Um, one thing of note here is that as he does this and he actually inoculates and it's successful, which I'll talk about in a moment, it was also at that time being tried in Britain, but instead of being any comer who wanted it in Boston, they offered seven condemned pr prisoners at the Newgate uh, prison the opportunity to go through inoculation and be freed if they survived, and it turns out they all survived. Uh, but I'll get into more specifics in a moment about what happened uh, in Boston. So. He went and brought this to the medical community, and there was only one medical doctor in Boston at the time. His name was William Douglas. He had graduated from the uh, University of Edinburgh. He'd also studied over in Paris. And he was the other person who was waiting for smallpox to come to Boston. And the reason was there was a lot of pestilence that was rampant and endemic. It was always occurring in Europe. But when you came to the United States, you had to go over several weeks of ocean. And oftentimes, it would play out a disease, or you'd identify it and quarantine them on Spectacle Island. But the reason that William, Dr. William Douglas had come here, he wanted to see what happened in a pure environment that didn't have much resistance to it. Uh, to document that, and that was going to be his way to get membership in the Royal Society back in London. When Cotton Mather brought it to uh, Dr. Douglas and four uh, barber surgeons that you had, there's an alternate course, you could do an apprenticeship, and then you could perform surgeries and perform medicine, but you weren't called a doctor officially. Uh, almost all of them shut him down except for one. There is a Dr. Zabdiel Boylston. Uh, he is otherwise 
famous for being the first person to uh, conduct a successful mastectomy in the Americas. And he was a renowned surgeon. He agreed with this in part because he had almost died, his wife had almost died, he'd lo almost lost several children to it, and he wanted, so he agreed to perform this procedure to try to uh, save people. He tried it first on his own son who was not immune and a slave, and then from there he went on to ultimately inoculate about 300 people total. And he did so at a cost of about four pounds a head for anybody who could pay, and four pounds in 1721 was about the equivalent of $900 per person. So the other thing, where I said Massachusetts supplies free of charge to anybody, this was only the rich who were getting this procedure. Uh, and of them, about 2% of them died. And of those 2%, about half of them were because they had been sick before, not necessarily with uh, smallpox, but they just didn't have a constitution that would survive the experience. Because when you had it, you had a version of smallpox, it was less, it was less likely to kill you, but it was not a benign procedure. And you could actually give it to other people, so they had to put you in special quarters, and part of the fee for the four pounds a person was that he had to come by and check on you every day, and if you ran into trouble, he would take care of you. Um, the general population, Boston actually did pretty well that time. Population was about 11,000 people. Half them were immune because they had been around long enough, and pretty much the entire half that was susceptible caught smallpox in the epidemic, and of them, instead of the typical 30% who died, it was 15% uh, who died. So if you inoculated, you had about 2% death risk, and if you caught the real thing, which if you weren't immune, everybody did, it was a 15% risk. Um, oh, and by the way, the other thing about this that's important, this is the book that Zabdiel Boylston was encouraged to write by the head of the Royal Society. Uh, he had traveled back to London after this exper experience, and at a time before statistics was a term, statistics in the mid-1700s meant the, the study of state, and it had to do more with looking at how many people did you have, how many farmers did you have, et cetera. But this is the first time where he went back, anybody went and looked at 30%, 15%, 2%, uh, that this procedure was statistically, you were better off doing this than not doing this. And so to have that first in the entire world be done in Boston, uh, to have inoculations in the United States done first in Boston, there's some other firsts for Massachusetts, uh, but that's his paper. Um, Boston as a town was not happy about this. Uh, there were several investigations where they brought Cotton Mather, they brought Zabdiel Boston before uh, the town council, before the, uh, the general court for the state. Um, they generally, rather than, he, they, both of them argued that people should look at the results to figure out if this made sense or not. They refused, they more did character assassinations. They hired a French physician, Dr. Laurence Dalfond, who was an expert in smallpox, but they paid him to make up false stories about witnessing inoculation done in other countries that did not do this, and it actually very much damaged his reputation in the process. Uh, and finally, they actually threw a grenade in the house of Cotton Mather. Uh, the wick fell out of it so that nobody was killed, but it had a sign attached to it that read, uh, I'll, inoculate, I'll inoculate you. So um, that was the reaction for Boston. Um, there was also a bit of racism in this because they didn't want to adopt a procedure that came from Africa, from Constantinople. Um, and, and one last interesting thing that came out as a result of this is that I said that there was two official papers. In the course of this, there was a printer who had re just returned from London, and to get his father to fund a third printing pro press, which was unheard of because 
in the entire United States, there was only four printing pr presses, and the other one had just opened in Philadelphia. His father made him, his father, who was a tallow chandler, he made candles out of pig fat and stuff. He had a, the 12 year old son as apprentice to him who wanted to be a seaman, and so he sent this guy over to go work with his brother. And when they founded the paper, they founded it on the idea that it was against vax, uh, inoculations. Uh, that 12 year old boy who at 15 started his career under the pseudonym Silence Do Good, uh, that was Benjamin Franklin. So Benjamin Franklin, who I'll finish with, started off uh, being anti-vaccines. Um, so that is the experience in Boston. The next thing I was gonna tell you about was actually the revolution because the revolution didn't start in 1776. The, in in uh, Chelmsford, we know it was 1775. 1775, as the fall went along, the idea was that they were going to win Canada. They assumed that French Canadians who had recently been taken over by the British would want to join the American cause. So they sent one group up from Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, they took Quebec, uh, Montreal and they marched on Quebec. And the other group went from Cambridge up to what is now Augusta and then took boats up and over to Quebec. The problem is, is that as both groups were approaching Quebec, both of them came down with smallpox. And so a third of the troops were taken out uh, at that time and the attack failed. And as Washington later reviewed this information, I mean, ultimately, 90% of all the casualties in the revolution were because of disease and not because of, war, of uh, conflict. He realized that most of the European troops who were coming over, British and German, they were immune to smallpox because of prior exposure. And most of the American troops had not been exposed out in the countryside and that they were susceptible and that looking at the evidence that came from the, the attack on Quebec, he reasoned that this was going to be the end of the war if he didn't take care of it. So even though the Continental Congress in Philadelphia had already taken actions to bar inoculations based on fears from other communities that hadn't tried it yet, he on January 6th of 1777 instructed Dr. William Shippen Jr to start inoculating the troops at camp in Morristown for the winter of 1777. And then the following year at Valley Forge, a lot of people talk about the training uh, that Van Steuben did to train the troops. But actually the biggest thing that they did at Valley Forge is that not being in conflict, group by group, they would send over all the troops uh, that were in the army already, as well as all new recruits over to what they, where they built an inoculation hospital and they would vaccinate everybody or inoculate everybody. That, they had less than 1%, they lost less, percent, less than 1% of the troops in that, in doing so. So, he informed the Continental Congress on uh, February 5th, a month after Dr. Shippen had started doing these procedures. And now I was gonna tell you about cowpox. Cowpox is not, it's related to smallpox, but it's not. And people had long noticed that milkmaids who milk the cows, especially if, they had, if the cows had the cowpox, that they would get a milder disease, mostly on the hands, didn't cause a lot of disfigurement, and then they would be immune and wouldn't be able to catch smallpox after this. And that's why in the 17th and 18th centuries they would talk about how beautiful the milkmaids were because they weren't scarred the way that most of the population was by smallpox. Edward, Dr. Edward Jenner had noticed this, and in 1796 he actually started doing a procedure similar to inoculation where he would, and this is actually is Dr. Pearson over at St. Pancras in uh, London. This is actually, so 
Jenner started doing his experiments in 1796. This is a cartoon done by Dr. G uh, Mr. Gilray from the Anti-Vaccination -Vaccin Society. And what they would do, you see that, that he would cut the skin and that they would put the pus from the cows into the lesions. You would develop a milder version of it and then you would be uh, safe afterwards. Um, what you can't see in here, I mean, you can see all the cows that are sort of popping out of people, but there's also the picture at the top is actually the golden bull saying in terms of religion, you know, dating, uh, going back to the, uh, to the Bible. Jenner's the one that came up with the words. So where uh, variolation is because of the variety that smallpox had, and inoculation, you can read it that it sounds like it means in your eyeball, but the reality is it's also the term for in the bud or grafting as you would graft a plant. And so that was the, what he called, what they early called the procedure. But when Jenner started doing this using cowpox, the word cow in Latin is vaca. And so the term smallpox of the cow is variola uh, vaccinii. And so he decided to call the procedure vaccination. So vaccination kind of means from the cow. Uh, and that term, people were coming up with vaccinations throughout the latter half of the 18th century. And Louis Pasteur, who famously figured out that germs, bacteria cause disease, and you can also you know, ferment using uh, microbes. He said, you know what? Let's just call all these procedures vaccinations uh, going for, forward. Um, with Massachusetts, uh, in 1802, it officially, when this painting, when this cartoon was get, uh, spread in London, Massachusetts officially gave its endorsement for the procedure of vaccination. And in 1855, Massachusetts became the, the state, uh, the first government uh, to recommend routine vaccinations. Uh, for the population. So with this, to take a step back, remember that this is looking at it in hindsight. If I was in Massachusetts in 1721, 1722, and somebody came up with that, this idea that had not been proven and I had never witnessed it, I really don't think I would have had the foresight that either Cotton Mather uh, nor Zabdiel Boylston had. Um, this was a time where they didn't have a germ theory just yet. Most of the accepted ther therapies were either bloodletting, where they, if you look sick enough, they just cut you open and let you bleed, or purging, where they would essentially just make you vomit or have diarrhea, thinking that was somehow going to wipe it out of you. It usually wiped you out and made you more susceptible to succumbing to the diseases. And I need to bring up an alternate course in this, which is homeopathy. The exact same year that Jenner started doing the uh, vaccinations with cowpox, Dr. Samuel Hahnemann uh, near Dresden in Germany came up with the idea that in Latin, similia similibus curentor, which means basically the, the same things, what makes you sick makes you better, that if you took a poison and it gave you a headache, then taking a dilution of that in either water or alcohol and banging it on an elastic surface, it would then immunize you against headaches going forward. Um, and if, I don't know if you can see this because this theory still holds today. If you look at ingredient, this is a, uh, it's at CVS. Uh, it's a homeopathic medicine. All these things are on the homeopathic list. If you look, ingredient number six is actually spiders. That the idea is if someone is afraid of spiders, if you do a dilution of tarantulas, you'll cure your child of nightmares. Um, this, his theory, he, had, he said it was due to miasms, uh, that they came first from scabies, and if you treated the symptoms, if you had a disorder of the skin and you treated the skin, you were missing the underlying cause, and therefore you weren't going to cure the person. And there were two other miasms. One was syphilis, and the other one is the Latin word for gonorrhea. Uh, 
and he thought everything had to do with the fact that somebody in your ancestry had one of these diseases and that would explain all, these three miasms would explain all of your afflictions. To this day, you can still get these products, obviously. Uh, two in particular, one was last year taken off the market finally. If when a child was young, anybody ever used Highland's teething tablets, that belladonna is a natural substance, so it's not regulated by the FDA. If you take it, it'll give you a headache, it'll give you a fever, it'll make you flush red, and if you get enough of it, it'll kill you. And what they used to do for Highland's teething tablets for babies is to do dilutions of that and put it in. But since these aren't regulated by the US government, they, their quality control was a little bit lax. And in some cases, believing these were natural products, families would give babies multiple ones. And I believe in 2018, they had, 18, they had 10 reported deaths. And so after 75 years, they took Highland's teething tablets. There's a similar product called uh, teething gel now, but it no longer has the belladonna in it. Um, and the last one is about homeopathy is no sodes, that you can actually go in certain parts of the world and get little white tablets. And what they have, they say that it has a vaccine-like effect. And what they do is that if they find somebody who has cancer or disease, they will either collect their tissue or feces or urine and do a dilution of that and then give you it with the idea that by taking that person's cancer that you're gonna immunize yourself against it. Um, this is a bigger problem in California than it is here in Massachusetts. But uh, let's kind of go back to, um, to more where modern medicine has gone with vaccinations. So the first thing I'll say is when people had anybody ever heard the term, the idea that if a child had a fever above 105, they might have brain damage? It's not true. What it, the reason it came about, the fever itself, if your body makes it, the fever itself won't harm you. Uh, it's different if you have heat stroke, if the temperature is from outside the body, you've been in a hot tub, you've been in the sun, that's very dangerous. If your body makes it, a fever, a temperature is very much like a thermostat. If your body detects a problem, it'll turn the thermostat up in a lot, in a way very similar to trying to get, trying to get rid of your in-laws when they've stayed too long. And if your body wants to be 105 and you're 103, you'll think you're cold. And if you're at 103 and you take Tylenol, it'll bring your temp down two degrees, your th thermostat set point. Motrin will bring down your temp about two degrees, suddenly you'll feel hot, and you'll wanna like dump the heat. But the fever itself doesn't do the damage. The reason people were told that is that before about 2000, there were two bacteria, pneumococcus and haemophilus influenza type B. If they got into your bloodstream or brain, they could kill you in about eight hours. And with that short a period of time, somebody who calls me on Sunday morning, I don't have, I can't wait to see them on Monday. You immediately set them into the emergency room. And if they were under four months old, they all had a blood and a urine and a spinal tap. And I've done those spinal taps. When I was a resident back in the 90s, it's before the 2000s. And you would have these kids come with fevers and they would always, their spine, spinal fluid would always be clear. And one day I went to get it and I was good at it, and I went to see if the cerebral spinal fluid dripped, and it didn't drip, and I noticed there's a thin spurt of pus going straight across the room under pressure. It was haemophilus influence type B. We gave the girl ceftriaxone, and she's 100% fine now. But I, didn't, I don't have to worry about that anymore. And the reason is that two vaccines that came out around 2000, pneumococcus and haemophilus influenza type B, work very, very well. And if a family calls me in, in Sunday morning now and says my child's 103.5, I say, what do they look like? If they're sitting there having troubles breathing and look like death warmed over, they go to the emergency room based on the way they look. And if it's 103.5 and they're looking pretty good, I'm like, no, just you know, keep the kid comfortable, push the fluids, I'll see you in the morning, make sure all's well. If anything else comes about, you give me a phone call. Two other things people were told that used to be true. One is that if you had a high fever, that might make you go blind. 
if you had a high fever, it might make you go deaf. If you had a high fever because of smallpox, it might destroy your eyesight, but it's not the fever, it was the smallpox that did it. If you had a high fever and it was measles, you might go deaf. It wasn't the fever, it was the measles that did it. So in terms of disease, I'll think of really five main things that cause diseases. This came about after Louis Pasteur in the late 1800s. Everybody thinks about bacteria. People think about fungus sometimes. People think about viruses. They don't really think about prions. Prions are misfolded proteins, and if, like, remember mad cow disease from a couple years ago? If your body is exposed to a misfolded protein, it might cause your own proteins to misfold. That's what that disease is. Um, and then there's uh, parasites. With these, I can, in a lot of cases, cure all but viruses and prions. If something is a form of life that is not exactly like me, bacteria are not animals or plants. Uh, if I can find a poison that'll kill that form of life and not kill me, I can be cured. The problem with viruses is they're technically not alive. A virus will be a little sliver of RNA or DNA or some code that found a way to splice into our cells and use our own chemistry to replicate itself, make us sick, and go on to the next person. So the problem with viruses, if I can't cure it, the best hope I have really comes down to antibodies, uh, which I'll discuss in a moment. Uh, things, other things to consider is sources. We're in Massachusetts now. There's Lyme disease. Lyme disease, everybody thinks about the deer, it's actually the mice that carry it and give it to the, uh, the deer ticks, and the deer ticks give it to us. Uh, so that if you have animals in the environment that have something that can give it to you, it might come from there. In the case of Lyme disease, there's also a vector. You have to have that deer tick. So control the mice, control the deer ticks, you might control the Lyme disease. But a lot of the diseases that we're talking about, smallpox, measles, these are diseases that only humans catch so that it isn't going to spontaneously just appear in your neighborhood. It has to be brought in from someplace. Historically, most often it was brought in by warfare, that there is some version of plague that they've found 3,000 years ago in Egypt, but it really didn't become a big problem until the Romans attacked Seleucid about 165 AD and they brought plague as we know it back to Rome and it ravaged Rome for 15 years before it came under control. The, which actually brings up the idea that these, there is an origin to them. Plague has not always existed from the time that life on Earth has existed. It came into being at some point and that point was probably about 3,000 and something about 165, it mutated into a form that was more contagious and more deadly and became what we know today. Measles didn't even exist as far as we know in Rome. Measles came into existence as far as we know about 800 AD and about 1050, it mutated into a form that was much more contagious. It's one of the most contagious. If you're exposed, there's a 93% chance you'll catch it if, unless you're immune to it. And you go back far enough there weren't these things. Going forward, it also means that there will be more diseases and those diseases will be beco be become potentially more contagious, more deadly in the process. Um, oh, and whenever talking about this in medicine, one of the great mysteries, one of the great debates is syphilis because syphilis as we know it really didn't exist in the Western world before Columbus's voyage. And so people have long tried to blame that it came from the New World and was one of the few diseases that went from the New World to the Old World as opposed to the other way around. But there isn't a lot of evidence that syphilis was a major disease in the Old World. So it may have actually just been something that happened to mutate the, about the exact same time. Syphilis, its other claim to fame is its name because for a long time when
Christopher Columbus came back to Spain and they went to war with Portugal, it became known as the Spanish disease. And when Portugal went to war with Naples, then it was known as the Portuguese disease. And when Naples went to war with France, it became known as the Naples disease. And finally, France went to war with everybody, and everybody pretty much called it the French disease, which the French didn't like. So there was a 16th century Italian poet who wrote a, a book on uh, syphilis. Some people think it might be a play on Sisyphus, the guy rolling the rock up the hill who could never quite, because he could never you know, get to his, it just rolled down the other side. And the idea that every time you cured one symptom of syphilis, something else popped up. But the name is actually for a shepherd boy in this poem so that we don't end up insulting the French. So in terms of defenses, uh, one is sanitation hygiene. Uh, if you look at the experience in Europe, there's one odd little city that never had the plague, and that's Salzburg. And the reason is once a week they would open up the sluices and flood the town and, wa and wash all the filth down into the river, and their rat population stayed under control, and supposedly they never had an outbreak. Uh, we had quarantine. The problem with quarantine is a lot of these viruses Chickenpox, you are most contagious two days before you have any symptoms whatsoever. So you've actually, and measles is the same way. So you've spread this before you know you have it. Um, and then you have obviously cases from Boston's history where if the captain of the ship doesn't want to be put in quarantine, he could avoid it and spread it. Uh, we have antibiotics. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. I just say that antibiotics eventually going to have resistance. That I was told that in my career, by the time I retire, we will no longer be using antibiotics for ear infections because all the typical ear infections will be resistant to all the antibiotics that we have. Uh, you can have antibodies. Antibodies can be either passive or active. And what I mean by that is that you can give somebody who is infected with something antibodies against a disease made someplace else, either another human or more likely in the 20th century it was done in horses. Or you could give somebody a little bit of the germ, some portion that shouldn't cause the real disease, and their body can then mount an immune response and make antibodies against it. Um, so the passive is when you get it from someplace else, active is when you induce somebody to make it yourself, and there's supportive therapies. If you have a disease you can't do anything about, you keep them hydrated, keep them comfortable. Um, with regard to vaccines, there are two forms of active immunization. One is a live vaccine and the other one is attenuated. A live vaccine is one that's been modified similar to Jenner's uh, vaccinations with cowpox, where it shouldn't cause the real disease and you're very unlikely to die fr from it, can still have side effects. Attenuated is where you've killed it or more likely these days you synthetically make a couple of the proteins from the germ, and then you can safely inject that with no risk of actually inducing disease. Most of the vaccinations we have are the attenuated that can't cause it. Uh, a couple of the vaccines like the measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox are live viruses that are supposed to set up many infections. Uh, percentages, when you get a series of vaccines, it's because the first time maybe you induce 60% immunity, second time 80%, third time 90% you never get to where 100% of the people vaccinated are immune to it. Uh, so that um, that's why there are people you have to worry about uh, who have been vaccinated. The other thing is that you will bump into non-responders, that some people, no matter how many vaccines you give them, they will never form antibodies against that disease. And an exquisitely important concept is that of herd immunity. The statistical, th bless you, there's a, a statistical threshold that if you immunize about 95% of the population, then enough are immune that the germ cannot move through the population going forward, and you've thereby pretty much protected everybody. Um, with regard to, bless you, with regard to uh, effectiveness, sometimes when you hear that the flu vaccine was only 50% effective this year, it's a little bit, it's not true. It's 50% effective at completely avoiding flu, but 
the majority of those people who are immunized who catch it have a much milder course. So that you're still talking about 95% of the people having a much better experience with it. The other thing is that when there are outbreaks, they tend to cluster around communities that aren't sufficiently immunized, that haven't achieved herd immunity. But when they report it in the news, they'll say that 50% of the people who uh, caught the disease had the vaccine and 50% did not have the vaccine. And it looks about equal, except when you consider that, say in Massachusetts, 99% of all children in Chelmsford are vaccinated against these diseases. So if you have 50-50, that means that that 1% who's not vaccinated, they were hit hard in that case. So side effects, typically what people are talking about, I mean, allergies are common. There are people who have allergic reactions to latex that's in the processing of some, uh, to the gelatin, to the neomycin that might be in the processing. Uh, a lot of times we're talking about pain or swelling or aches or headaches. Uh, there are people that if they develop pain after a vaccination and they pass out, especially if they're t a teenager who's driving home, it's a problem. And there's one that pops up and we're never quite 100% certain if it's due to the vaccines or not, called Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre is the name of a neurologic problem that affects both the motor neurons going out to tell the muscles what to do, as well as the sensory neurons going back and it tends to be the hands and feet, and it can go centrally and affect breathing. It happens to about one in 100,000 people in the United States every year. The moment it does, people just assume that it's gonna be due to something, and they ask you, have you taken Motrin? Have you take, had a vaccine in the last six months? So we warn people about it, but it's not 100% clear if it's the actual cause, uh, the vaccine was the actual cause of the, of the, uh, of the Guillain-Barre. With regard to mistakes over the years, in the 1890s when they were making new vaccines, if people have ever had a, a PPD test for tuberculosis, the antigen that's put in there was originally designed to be a vaccination that you could, they, that the doctor intended it to, you, you could vaccinate somebody against tuberculosis, except for the fact that what actually happened is that people who had latent tuberculosis and didn't know it, you could induce it by vaccinating them. So it was a bad idea. Now we use that just to identify uh, who has it, um, but not to vaccinate. With regard to diphtheria in the 1930s, they used to inject it into horses, and then the horses would make antibodies, and then you could give the antibodies that the horses made to people who actually had the disease diphtheria. And they unfortunately had two instances where the horses themselves had tetanus, and they inadvertently gave tetanus to the people they gave it to. And the last major in incident in 1960 was the Cutter incident in Berkeley, California, where a manufacturer of the live sock vaccine didn't process it properly and ended up making uh, 120,000 doses of live polio vaccine, not the vaccine, but the live polio. They injected it into 40,000 people 55 of which developed paralytic polio because of the shot that they got that was supposed to protect them. Five of those people died, and in addition to the people who got the vaccine, because it was real polio and not the vaccine, there was an equal number of people in the community, 40,000 who were exposed who developed some, 55 who developed paralytic polio, five people who died who were exposed to people who had this bad vaccine. You hear a lot about fears amongst the anti-vaccine uh, community, this has always been a judgment about the risk of the disease versus the risk of the vaccine. As time has gone on, we've made the vaccines very much more safe than they ever were. But when you, people in a generation or two doesn't see the disease, they start to question if it is worth getting the vaccine. Autism came up a couple years ago. There was an article published in The Lancet in 1998 by Andrew Wake, Dr. Andrew Wakefield. He had 12 patients who had autism, and he said, well, what did they do? They recently got this vaccine. There's also other things that they recently did. Maybe if we separate out the measles, mumps, and rubella components, 
maybe people wouldn't develop, maybe it's causing autism and maybe that might reduce the chances of it. And there were a couple problems. One is that when they actually did the huge studies with millions of patients, there's now, there have now been 11 of them, they find no relationship between the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine and with autism. And in the process, they found out that of the 12 patients that were in his study, several of them were in the process of suing the, van the vaccine manufacturer because of a link to autism. They had actually paid him to do the study and some of his data was altered. He has since, the article's been withdrawn, he's lost his medical license. He does still do lectures. Uh, when you hear that there are communities uh, like Somalis out in the Midwest, it's because they, in being marginalized, sometimes they're looking for advice for their people and they'll bring an expert over like Dr. Wakefield. Um, people said it might cause asthma, maybe we, like, we are protecting ourselves too much and people might be at risk for developing allergies or asthma. When they went to research this, what they found was that we're too clean. If you live someplace with dirt floors, if you pick your child's pacifier up off the ground, stick it back in their mouth, uh, then you are less apt to have problems like asthma and allergies. People have worried because there's a, when you had multi-dose vaccines, there was a product called thimerosal. It's a mercury product. Uh, it's water soluble. It shouldn't cause problems. But because people were concerned, they actually took it out of almost all vaccines except for the multi-dose uh, flu vaccine. There is something called adjuvant that if you give a vaccine and you put a little tiny amount of aluminum in there, it will actually have a tenfold response. And the volume to give a child a full teaspoon in a shot would be too much. So that you use this little bit of aluminum in there. And people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. have been concerned that maybe this might be causing problems. They have since found that uh, there's actually more aluminum in breast milk uh, and the dose in soy milk is about 135 times the amount, in, sorry, 35 times what it is in all the shots that children get by six months. Um, people worry about vaccine load, that maybe by giving too many shots at once or too many shots when the child was young, that, that might uh, cause a problem. They've looked at it extensively. It does not appear to cause a problem. Uh, the other thing is that even though in the last 30 years we've gone from seven routine vaccines up to 14 routine vaccines, they've actually reduced the number of particles in there to one-tenth what they were before by purifying out mainly the pertussis vaccine. Um, there are special populations. When you talk about pregnant women, rubella as a disease isn't all that bad if you are outside the womb, but inside the womb, it can kill the fetus and lead to a, blind, a whole series of other problems. So with the rubella vaccine, they've proven it safe in the second and third trimesters, but they try to avoid giving it in the first trimester, even though accidental injections have never shown that the vaccine causes the problems that the real rubella does. Uh, infants are particularly susceptible. They don't have a, a developed immune system. They don't have a great blood-brain barrier. Things get things progress rather fast with them. They also, pertussis, whooping cough, if you catch it, anything outside the infant period, you'll cough, 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 and make a big whoop at the end of it after you've squeezed all the air out of your lungs. Infants cough, 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 and then forget to breathe. So when they catch it, you need to put them in the hospital for about three months on IV erythromycin. Uh, it's a long course. And with regard to measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, when you're born, you have mom's immunity. If you give that too young, mom's antibodies will simply block it. We wait till the kids are over a year old. Uh, immunocompromised, we used to, if somebody at home had AIDS or was on chemotherapy, not vaccinate the children with live vaccines, they found out that nobody has ever caught it from a child who was vaccinated against live vaccines and that the immunocompromised person was more likely to pick up the wild, the real germ, from a child who was unimmunized. So now we immunize the children in those families. Uh, and then, of course, travel. If you're going to be going to, what we vaccinate for here is what we're worried about here, 
but if you're going to go someplace that has other diseases like yellow fever, there's recommendations for that. The body that determines what vaccines are recommended is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Uh, it started in 1964. It's five members over at the Center for Disease Control. There is, since 1990, what is called the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. I've had patients that if they had a bad effect, I had a child who developed diarrhea after having an anti-diarrheal vaccine. And they send out people that come on the black they look like the IBM men with the black ties and everything. And they did a lot of research and found that basically this is a child who picked up the wild, the real germ, just coincidentally at the same time they got the vaccine. There is also the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. Every vaccine that is given has a 75 cent charge on it that goes into a pool. And there is the vaccine court that if your child or adult has a complication of a vaccine, they judge what the appropriate compensation would be. For vaccin vaccinations for children, there have been, at least historically, three types of exemptions. One is medical. If somebody has an allergic reaction, if they have an adverse ev event uh, related to a vaccine, they don't have to get it. I write a little note, the school's done with it. They don't get the vaccine. The second and historically largest group was religious uh, exemptions. And over the last five years, the last major religion in the world has decided that they are okay with vaccines. And so currently five states have gotten rid of religious exemptions and Massachusetts is considering it. Uh, historically, the Catholic Church had some issue. There were some therapeutic abortions that the tissues in the 60s were used to develop several vaccine lines, including rubella. In 2005, the Pontifical Academy for Life, uh, the national, in, over in Rome, the National Catholic Bioethics Center here in the United States, and uh, Pope Benedict XVI himself said that uh, the benefit far outweighs the sin. Going forward, they would hope that further vaccines would be developed without the use of fetal tissues and that they estimated that 5,000 children a year are saved by the mothers being vaccinated against rubella, so they actually want it done. Uh, Christ scientists have, Mary Baker Eddy herself said that if you catch a disease, they want to pray and have God heal the patient, but that they technically had nothing against vaccinations from the start. Jehovah's Witness are concerns with blood products. They don't want the immunoglobulins for the act passive immunization given. And the very last religion that decided it no longer had an objection was the Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, it's a Calvinist sect. They thought that if providence, if God wanted you to die, then it was God's will you should accept your fate. In 2012 to 2014, they had an, they had an outbreak they had 3,000 people affected, about 180 people were, were uh, hospitalized, and three people died. And after that, the logic was akin to the joke that you may have heard about the man in the flood, where he's at the, the start, rain start coming, the water's rising, and the truck drives out to the house, and he says, no, no, God will save me. And a little while later, the flood waters uh, came along, and he's starting to climb up towards the roof, and a boat comes along, and he says, no, no, God's going to save me. Save me. And then a little while later, he's stuck on the last little bit of his roof. The helicopter comes by and says, no, no, God's going to save me. And then finally he succumbs. And when he goes to the pearly gates and he meets God, he says, I, I was waiting for you. And God said, I sent you a truck and a boat and a helicopter. What more do you want? So the Dutch Reformed Church uh, said that they no longer have an opposition uh, to vaccination. The third exemption, which is not held by many states, is the personal uh, or philosophical exemption where somebody just says, I don't want to vaccinate my kid. Most states have gotten rid of that, uh, and many more are actually like, thinking of getting rid of it. Uh, these cases have gone before the US Supreme Court. The first was in 1905, Jacobson versus the state of Massachusetts. And in the nine cases that have gone before the court, the first one ruled that it was the common good, that at the time smallpox was a chronic disease in the United States. But seven of the nine decisions weren't made on common good ground. 
they were made on child neglect. The idea that it is an objective truth that a vaccine scientifically is better for the child and a parent who has a different belief is neglecting the child's health and the child should receive the vaccine against the parent's uh, will. Um, small things, uh, individual examples, rabies. The vaccine's 100% effective and the disease is considered 100% deadly. Uh, there are a few children now who have lived through it, but one unique thing about rabies is number one, it has to come from a bite. Uh, and the second thing is that if you are bit, the vaccine, if you start the, pro the protocol within six days, it will cure you 100%. And so that's only for exposures, uh, which include, by the way, if you have a bat in the house, go get your shots because their teeth are so sharp you don't necessarily feel it in your sleep. Uh, HPV vaccines come out recently. This is a new concept that we're not, we prevent a disease, but the reason is because the human papillomavirus, certain strains, particularly ones you get as a sexually transmitted disease, can later cause cancers in life. And the idea of the vaccine is then to prevent you from ever catching these cancers. It's been around for long enough that we actually have been able to, to show it reducing the risk of death. Um, Lyme disease, there was a vaccine and it, it didn't sell. They took it off the market, it's not coming back. Part of the reason it didn't sell is when it came out to Massachusetts, in, Mass in Middlesex County, we had on average eight cases a year in the entire county, so it wasn't really of use. Now I have eight cases a year in my practice alone. Uh, in the French-speaking countries, there is the BCG vaccine, Bacillus calmet guerin and it is against tuberculosis. It's not particularly good. It prevents 70% of the, of the uh, cerebral tuberculosis, but very little of the pulmonary. So we don't use it because it, it ruins our chance of tracing by the PPD test in this country. Um, and with rotavirus, that's the stomach bug. When it first, the vaccine first came out, they had an unexpected side effect. The original company took it off the market. The second company confirmed that this is a uh, side effect and just makes us aware. We tell parents that if the child has bloody diarrhea, to give us a phone call. Um, so in outbreaks, the measles we have going on right now, there really comes down to three reasons. One is that even if the people are affected, like I said, 50-50 with people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated, it tends to occur in under-vaccinated communities that don't have the herd immunity. The second thing is that it happens with isolated groups, such as the, the uh, Somalians in the Midwest who uh, had Andrew Wakefield talk to them. Uh, and the third one is kind of unique to New York. The Jewish community, certain groups have to have a minion, M-I-N-Y-A-N. They have to have 10 adults in order to go out which prevents the mother from taking her children to the doctor's office for their routine vaccines. So they're trying to look for like ways to immunize that community uh, based on their specific needs. Um, so that said, oh, I just want to put this up here. This is a famous painting called The Doctor from uh, 1891. Uh, the painter is actually the doctor here. It's himself, that's his daughter who he used as a model but it's actually painted based on him watching his one-year-old firstborn uh, die of a disease that isn't mentioned. Um, so these diseases do still exist and they are just as bad and they may be worse at some time. The fact that we don't see them here, uh, we have been lucky. I would love if we could make things like measles extinct which I thought was a real possibility 19 years ago. Uh, but until that happens, if we have a na naive population, we run the risk that if we don't achieve herd immunity, it could come and hit us and wipe out the same way it did, wipe people out the way, same way it did historically. So uh, I would recommend that people get them, their families immunized. And I was going to close with a short quote from Benjamin Franklin. As I said, he started off his uh, reporting career as a character by the name of Silence Do Good uh, for a paper that was started to be anti against vaccines. And about five years later, he lost 
sorry, 10 years later, he lost his four-year-old son to vaccines. And he had two thoughts. The general one is, quote, I long regretted bitterly and still regret that I had not given smallpox to him by inoculation. This I mention for the sake of the parents who omit, omit that operation on the supposition that they should for, never forgive themselves if a child died under it. My example showing that the regret may be the same either way and that therefore the safer should be chosen. So you might die from smallpox, you might die from the inoculation because people did, but you should weigh the two against each other and do the safer operation. The second quote was because of what it does within families. People have long speculated that his 20 year separation from his wife was based on his promiscuity, but increasingly people are thinking that it might not be that, it might actually be his son's death. Um, he said, if one parent or near relation is against inoculation and the other does not choose to inoculate a child without free consent of all parties, lest in case of a disastrous event, perpetual blame shall, uh, should follow. And it's thought that what he's saying, because he at that time had become for vaccination after seeing the experience in Boston, his wife was always against the vaccination. And the thought is maybe he blamed his wife for the, their child's death and that that was the strife in the family. So, uh, I hope people learned something. I hope they enjoyed. I thank you for coming. And uh, that is all. <laughs> <laughs>